Welcome to this episode of The Wolf and the Shepherd. Today we have with us Emily Bauchectus. Uh, and I probably already screwed up your name, didn't I? Did, <laughs> no, I, that's did, good. I, did I get it right? Did I get it right? Yeah. We, we were just talking about this before we hit the record button, and I was really sweating the fact of being able to pronounce your name right. So I'm, I'm glad. That. I'm glad I got it right. I'm glad I got it right. So, uh, <laughs> Emily, so glad you could join us. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. This is going to be great fun. Now, you're an associate professor of psychology at NYU. Just uh, for a quick experiment, before we spoke to you, neither of us knew how to pronounce your last name, and we weren't going to be the ones to bring it up. We were just going to refer to you as Emily and then just let people read your last name on the website. So um, why is there that hesitancy for people to ask what would be a very reasonable and basic question? Why is that level of embarrassment there for us to just say, hey, how do you pronounce your last name? Well, a different kind of psychologist might say it's a fear that's deeply rooted into some attachment problems you've had with your mother in the past, but I'm not that kind of psychologist. I'm not a clinical psychologist. I'm not here to understand or unpack the last 40 years of your life and, and, and how you grew up. I'm a social psychologist. I'm a behavioral scientist. So that just means that I'm really interested in studying the decisions, the actions, the things that you do now and what motivations, what are the social contexts, the situations we find ourselves in that might push behavior one way or another. But probably experience. I have a lot of experience with people mispronouncing my name and you don't know that. So maybe you didn't think to ask me about my name, but I knew I should probably give you a give you a heads up. Yeah, right. We, we well, could have probably guessed that a lot of people mispronounce that. Yeah, that's yeah. true. And we have names that are pretty easy to pronounce, so we yeah. don't have to worry about that. They they both are pronounced just like the written. Well, they're both English as well. Well, that is true. Where's your name from, actually? It's actually Lithuanian. Oh, okay. Oh, there you go. Yeah. So we were having an argument before we started the show. Uh, well, not an argument, more of a discussion. And because uh, he wanted me to introduce you as the lecturer from NYU. And I said, well, that sounds like it's a little too English for me to say. I mean, can I just say she's a professor? He said, well, uh, not every lecturer is a professor. And so I had to call BS on that a little bit, and we did a little research. And did you know that in England you have to have a PhD to be called a professor? But over here in America, all you have to do is be a teacher in a college, and you're called a professor. Well, colloquially, uh, informally, yeah, you get called professor because your, your students just call you that, like if, if you teach at a university. But actually, like I'm not a professor. I'm an associate professor because professor for those that know, it means that you are done with, we're done with proving to other people that you have something to contribute. I still have something I have to prove. I got to prove to my colleagues that I, that there's still one last big push of something to put out into the scientific world. So, uh, so it's even more complicated than you rightfully brought to people's attention. Yeah. So basically that means neither one of us are ever going to be called professor because we still have so much to prove and we're not going to get it ever proved. Not, not spending another four years in college. No, uh, or that. Yeah. yeah. I, I already did that I tour. I, I already did that twice. I don't think I can survive yeah. college a third time. No, I, I so, can't do it either. Yeah. But let's get serious. So right. go ahead. So Emily, um, when people hear the word psychology, there's a lot of this, somebody laying down, somebody sitting on a chair asking questions and you think, hold on a moment, that's a psychiatrist. But honestly, I read a stat that like 70% of people get psychiatrist and psychologist confused at face value unless they actually read more actually what the article or title is about. So can you just explain to us basically the difference between psychology and psychiatry? Totally. Psychiatrists have gone to medical school. Psychologists did not go to medical school. So psychiatrists can prescribe medications. They might see patients and have therapy sessions where they're asking questions about where does the anxiety, where does the depression, where does the X issue that brought you to my office, where does it come from? They might ask those kinds of questions. Um, and, and they will to some degree, but then their preferred course of action is going to include medical intervention. Usually, you know, if you heard of Lexapro or Xanax or something that might help with some of the 
the symptoms that you're experiencing, it takes a psychiatrist to make that kind of a prescription, or you can get it from your medical doctor too, like a general practitioner. Uh, so that's a psychiatrist. Psychologists, it, they, that is a very general term. That's a very general career path, and there's lots of forms that it could take. So in this context, you're probably talking about like a, a clinical psychologist who sees patients, you know, in a, in a clinic, in their office, there might be one of those laying downy kinds of chairs, or there might just be a couch or something. And you're there to talk it through. And a lot of clinicians use, you know, maybe um, what some people might call like the uh, uh, psychoanalytic style, where they really do want to go all the way back to the beginning, see what your childhood was like, and try to trace through your current day to see what sort of recurrent problems you're experiencing and coping strategies you might use. Other psychologists might have that same setup. You come visit their office, you maybe lay in the chair, sit on their couch, and they are more cognitive behaviorally oriented. They wanna understand, well, what are you thinking? And when you have those thoughts, how are you acting? And can we change those? Can we change your thoughts or can we change your actions? Can we give you a new choice, a new sort of behavioral prescription, not a medical prescription that, that might change your experience in a way that you want? That's clinical psychology. Those people have PhDs also. They've gotten the terminal degree. They've been in school for a super long time, um, but they're working in a clinical setting. There's lots of other ways to be a psychologist. And I too have my PhD, but I don't see patients. I don't have an office with a laying downy chair. And when I'm working with individuals, I am not doing like case study interviews to really understand their past. Like I said, I'm a behavioral scientist. I want to understand and look for general patterns in human behavior. So I craft, I have a research lab, just like a, a chemistry professor would have a lab with white coats that people wear in a table and they put in chemicals and see what happens. I do the same thing, not with chemicals, but social situations. So in my lab, when people come to my building, they will, they will you know, walk into a room that I've crafted, into a social context or a conversation or a script that I designed, and then I'm measuring their reactions. And I'll do that for hundreds of people. And then I use statistics to try to see what's the typical response or who is, is one, one reaction more common for, or what's the type of person that a different reaction is common for, so that I can make general statements about like, when you're encountering, when you have this kind of conversation with somebody who's your boss and they start it off with feedback about your performance and say X, most people react like this. And if they react differently, it's because they're this kind of a person or they found themselves in this other kind of social situation. So as a behavioral scientist, that's what I'm doing. I am studying behavior and I'm studying those social situations that change what one person does versus another person does. In a sense, I can also write prescriptions. So people come to me a lot, like in podcasts like this, and they say like, like New Year's resolutions, why, why do we keep setting them? And why are we always failing at them? Tell me, what's the answer to that? And that's what my kind of psychology is best equipped to do. We can answer those kinds of questions and we can offer an answer to thousands, hundreds of thousands of people that would apply to the majority. That's what we're looking for is here is an answer to that kind of general question of something that so many people experience. And here are two or three or four answers or suggestions that might help give some insight into that. So is a lay downy chair what people in New York call a couch? <laughs> No, I'm thinking like, think back to Freud, right? Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, where it's like a chaise lounge that you can oh, really right. luxuriate yeah. in. That's what I'm, when I'm talking about that. Okay. Couch. That's, that's, <laughs> that's way too many syllables yeah. for taxes. Right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so um, my, my thoughts about uh, psychiatry has always been somebody basically applying a very strict set of rules and protocols under the guise of trying to get your patient to be existential when in reality they tend to be guided to a specific box a psychiatrist wants to check to whereas you know it's sold as i guess therapy in a way and counseling but i always feel that the psychiatrists have an agenda in terms of where they want to push your decision about what you are and who you are and what you should do Whereas psychology, I always feel, is more about opening your mind that 
you know, it's about you truly discovering yourself, your motivations, what makes you you. So I kind of have the opinion that psychiatry and psychology tend to go a little bit in opposite directions from each other. Yeah, uh, I, I totally understand that. And I'm sure that resonates with a lot of people who maybe have had good or bad experiences in, in one of those areas. But really, anybody who's good at their job in these spaces is, is going to be open minded. You know, like medical doctors, as a psychiatrist is, who decides, you know what, everyone's problem is anxiety. That's the problem. And then decides that they're going to see patients with that in their mind, that your problem is anxiety. And I'm just waiting for you to tell me something that confirms you have anxiety because I really like this drug and think that that works. That's not a good doctor, right? They're going to, they're going to misdiagnose people in instances and maybe prescribe the wrong course of treatment. So that's not a good doctor who would see the world through that kind of monocular lens, like just through that one field of view. Um, but I'm sure those people are out there as, as those people are in any field, they, they want to think that their way is the right way and they don't want to entertain other possibilities. It is not to say that that kind of thinking or that kind of problem does not show up in other forms of therapy that a psychologist might do. And in fact, you see that because they have specializations. Some people specialize in cognitive behavioral therapy or some therapists, psychologists specialize in you know, uh, attachment theory. And they think it comes down to attachments you formed as a child will have a lasting impact on the relationships that you have for the entire rest of your life. Now that's their area of focus because when they were studying in school, that's what they thought made the most sense. And they really dove into that area and became an expert. And so when you, if you're looking for a therapist, or you're looking for a psychologist, they almost all have websites or, you know, there's like psychology today. will 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 tell you the backgrounds of these people. And it'll give you words like that, that clue you in into, well, what, what do they think is the best way to help people when people are coming in saying like, I don't like what's happening in my life. That's what leads people to find a psychologist, right? People don't come in and say, everything about my life is fine. Let's talk about it for the next six months, once a week for an hour, and I'll pay you, you know, $200 an hour. Like they hardly come when things are great. They come because there's a problem that I want solved. What I am doing isn't working. And so uh, somebody will say, you know, like, I think we should do that through cognitive behavioral therapy. Let's, let's solve that issue this way, or let's solve it by studying your attachment issues, or let's solve it through medication, because that is my area of expertise. So, you know, everybody sort of sees the world through the, their own lens, and that there are options that are on the table that they don't necessarily entertain, because that's not their specialty. That's not what they think is most effective. Um, so you're right about, about maybe psychiatry pushes in one agenda, um, but, and that is true to some degree, but that's true about every different profession. And, and that's why we're looking for experts to help, but we should just be aware of that. When you're choosing an expert, you're also choosing sort of a, a course of action that, that they think is going to work. I'm choosing to go down this path using this tactic with you. Yeah, that makes sense. And kind of going back to what you were saying about you have your little lab, right? And, you know, you bring people in, you put them in these situations that you're observing, you're you're looking for stuff. It kind of reminds me of the study, and I'm this is a famous study, so I know you know this one, where there's like five dudes and they're sitting at a table and they're saying, okay, which one of these lines is longer on the board? And all four of the people say, the shorter line's actually longer, and the fifth dude kind of gets peer pressured into saying, well, I know that line's longer, but everybody else is saying this one is really the long line. So, you know, he raises his hand with them, and it's kind of that famous, and I know you're shaking your head. You know the exact one. So I'm leading into that with, like, social media and Instagram and all that good stuff that kind of puts that peer pressure on now. Are you seeing a lot of kind of a change in people's mind being so manipulated, I'll use that word, of what's going on with social media and, and the whole how many likes did I get on that and we're changing our psyche because of that? Yeah, so manipulation is an interesting word and, and that resonates with me too, that we're being manipulated. When we say manipulation though, a lot of people get turned off and they're like, that doesn't happen to me. No one's gonna manipulate me. I am independent, I am free. And I am not susceptible to being manipulated. So, you know, part of me 
hopes that using that word right now doesn't turn people off from listening to our conversation about this. Because yeah, in some sense it's manipulation, but it's also something that even the most free independent people um, can experience because it's about conformity. It's about needing to belong. It's about finding your place in this world. And so you're sitting in a room and four of your buddies are saying you know, like, like this line is super long, this line is super long, but you know that they're crazy. You like know that that's not right. But in the moment you're like, wait a minute, like how could these four friends of mine say that they see this thing this way and I'm seeing something totally different. Like is something wrong with me? Like I trust these people. Like I have stuff in common with them. And they're seeing the world in a different way than me. And you start to second guess your own conclusion because these are people that you respect, that you've been around with, they've been right before. So why would they, you know, are they in conspiracy or cahoots with each other to like punk me or something? You start to ask yourself all these questions for why do I see it differently than like these other guys that I have always respected and liked and been around and like who are part of my social media circle they're doing something different than me now. So it raises questions, that's what it can do. And in the moment you might just say like, yeah, okay, those guys are right, that line is long. Even though you don't really believe it or you're not sure, because it's easier um, to agree with them than to be like, what is wrong with you people, right? And to like call four buddies on something publicly um, that you're not sure about. So there's a lot of like, you know, social psychology going on in that situation that is not about other people manipulating you. It's about second guessing yourself. It's about wondering who's getting it right, who's getting it wrong, what's happening here? Is it worth it? Is it worth it for me to challenge what these people are saying when it could mean that I lose a friendship or people start making judgments about me, about like me being the problem? Am I missing something here? So when you're talking like all of this applies to social media as well, you're in a, you're in a world and this world is saying something and you've trusted this world before and they've sent you in the right direction before, or so you think, and then they start going a little bit different, a little bit different, a little bit different, a little bit different. And it can be harder to pull out because then it's like, well, where do I belong? This is where, this is where I'm, this is where like, you know, my river is flowing and I got to flow with it or, or what's left for me. Yeah, when we had a Nerva Shan on the show um, talking about his book, The Creative Mindset, mm -hmm. uh, we discussed briefly about groupthink. And I have a um, this kind of viewpoint that groupthink tends to diminish creativity and expansion of ideas simply because of that peer pressure and wanting to kind of keep in sync with everybody else in the group. With the example that the shepherd brought up with the lines, people are scared of being ostracized via a difference of opinion, even if they know they are correct and they would rather be wrong together than have four people, four of their friends be wrong and well, then be correct. But most people. Yeah, but that, most people. Yeah, most people, because that ostracization can occur whether you win or whether you lose if it separates you from your peers. But you know, there were more disturbing experiments done in history regarding a group of people of, say, like, again, four people, and you got three of them to commit heinous acts, then the fourth out of that peer pressure would also join in in those atrocities. Now, unlike the line example, which was purely about social grouping, um, the example was somebody completely throwing away their morality and basically joining into an evil act to keep that, I guess, acceptance by their peers. I mean, what what is that about in psychology that just that wanting to belong socially can make you destroy or abolish everything you agree with and believe in just to feel part of a group? Right, so um, yeah, you brought up one example um, that I think probably, you know, hits people in their heart. Like, how could I, how could I kill somebody because this group, this group is expecting it of me. Um, you can see that playing out with, you know, child warriors in, in civil wars in Africa, where they have 12 year olds that are shooting their neighbors that like raise them because they get embedded within, within a, a civil war and a side of this conflict that is using them as, as, 
and as enemies and as murderers. And so we all wonder, how is that possible? How could this, you know, a 12 year old do these kinds of things? And there's so much that goes into it. You put on the table group think. Um, and group think is the idea that we all coalesce with our ideas, even though there should be a divergence of opinion um, or that there could be, and why aren't we hearing it? So that's, that's what the term group think means. Um, there's an event that that happened that every, that you're aware of, I know, but that involves groupthink and helps explain a little bit of the psychology of these moral issues as well. Remember the Challenger, the space shuttle Challenger explosion in the 80s, um, and that was awful, right? It was awful because you know the at, soon within a few seconds of launch of the Challenger uh, on board was you know the first sort of non-conventional astronaut, an elementary school teacher whose students were there watching her in the space shuttle and it exploded within a few seconds. So within, you know, near space, visible to everybody, like cameras, news reporters and the people on the ground. So everybody watched all of these lives perish and this horrific event happen. And so in probing, why did that happen? How did that happen? It was because it was a really, really cold morning. And that freezing cold morning affected the, the, the seals, these O-rings that, that were central for keeping gases where they needed to be in the right space. The, the freezing temperatures contracted the rubber of these O-rings and gases escaped that shouldn't have and caused the explosion. Now, wait, they know that after the fact that that was the, one of the problems, but they also knew it before. They knew before that these O-rings would be compromised by, by if the temperature dropped too low and they knew that it was below that temperature. So then why didn't anybody like call an audible and stop this from happening? Or in the developmental stages when they were creating these O-rings in the first place and using them, why didn't they forewarn? And there's of course lots of answers, but one of those that's implicated is groupthink that there is a power hierarchy. Some people are in charge. Some people don't recognize that the O-ring and temperature issue is a problem or that it's as severe as it is. But you've got to call somebody. You've got to call a boss on their, like, their naivety or their ignorance and say, you've got this wrong and this is a much bigger problem. And that is so hard to do. When you add power to the mix, not just that we're all a group of equals here, but my job is on the line, right? Yes, other people's lives were on the line and it's easy after the fact to just say like, yeah, but people died because you were afraid. You were afraid to like call a boss on a mistake that you knew. Yeah, but when you're in that moment, you start wondering, am I right? Is the data that I have, is it sufficient enough to like jeopardize my health, my safety, my job, my family's longevity, like whether I can put food on the table for my kid. And you start to wonder, is it worth it? Is it worth the risk? Am I certain enough to, to risk all of this? And oftentimes the answer is no, especially when everyone else in that room, just like that line study, which line is longer, people didn't say like, you're wrong. You're wrong about this and intervene. It was sort of easier in the moment to go with the flow and to not say there's a problem with the O-rings and it's gonna be catastrophic because of that uncertainty, because of group conformity, because of groupthink. Yeah. I think so, you could also look at it to be a little nefarious, right? So you could you could get a group of guys together, and I'm just going to use this as an example, so please don't take offense to this as a woman, but you could get a group of guys together at a bar and take kind of the low man and the totem pole in that group, uh, just for lack of a name, let's use Eric as an example, uh, it, that's an inside joke with us. But you could convince that guy to say, hey, go hit on that woman over there, even though everybody at the table is saying, yeah, you really shouldn't do that. But you could turn around and convince him with that peer pressure, with that group think, to turn around and actually do something he wouldn't do, and it would carry horrible consequences, Absolutely possibly. You the wrong person for that example, didn't you? Yeah, I kind of did. did. <laughs> yeah, I kind of did. Because <laughs> I'm, I'm realizing, yes. you know, maybe. Yeah. yeah well, let's yeah, not go down that yeah, road. Let's right. go. No, yeah. But, but you, you see my point. And, and it, you can use that group think for a nefarious purpose to make everybody kind of have a giggle in that. Or, like in your example with the challenger, you know you could have looked at that and said, hey, you know, we're going to just let this slide and use that group think, say, no, everything's fine. You know, we're the people in charge, so to speak. Just let it go, let it go. There's going to be no problems, blah, blah, blah. And then convince everybody around that, well, yeah, they all said that. You know, they, that person, and, 
and maybe this is the wrong term, but they don't have the self-esteem or the self-confidence to stand up for themselves and say, no, I'm going to take a stand on this. It's so much easier to kind of disappear in the background, so to speak. Totally, right? It takes a very powerful person to stand up to 12 others that are pushing you in one direction um, than, to, than to go against that current, to go against that flow. That is really hard to do. And we all like to think that we could, that we would be that person if it matters, if there are consequences, if somebody's going to get hurt. I want to think that about myself, but I also know that most people don't. It is too hard in the moment uh, for most people to challenge a group when you're when you're doing that solo yeah i think you know psychology was overlooked for probably pretty late into the 70s and 80s in developing minds in kids because kids were always treated as if they had very chemotropic type needs you know they only got angry or happy when they were denied or you know, given one of these chemotropic needs. But, you know, studies have shown that, you know, manipulation or nefarious intent through media can lead to some very bad segments of society. I mean, it's the only way through constant propaganda in, you know, rogue countries where you have the people seemingly support, you know, the actions of their leaders. It's that the propaganda is so strong you know, and so ingrained from such a young age that things which perhaps we believe we can clearly see as, you know, not right, they're brought up that, you know, wrong is right and right is wrong as such, and so that you can almost be taught anything. But, you know, even in the United States, I mean, the CIA have been known ever since, you know, the 60s, you know, to take part in psychosocial um you know, experiments, you know, whether you go through an Operation Mockingbird and the effect of media, you know, on the general public. Now we have an issue with this social construct, that of social media, something which doesn't exist, but does exist more in the mind than in the physical world. Mm -hmm. And this now is causing more damage, more misinformation, more polarization than anything that ever came before it. Because unlike the news, where we chose to sat in fr sit in front of the TV, this is now with us and 24 hours a day, we can see what Aunt Susie thinks about blah, blah, blah. And we're in all these different social construct groups. And now this has kind of taken over a lot of our psyche and self-identification. So what difficulties is this going to create for the generations coming through? Because obviously we're used to the old ways and can still attach ourselves to those, but kids are growing up with this is normal, that this is their ID in this virtual world. Totally, right? So you brought up you brought up Aunt Susie, Aunt Sally, Aunt somebody, mm. whatever, right? Like, you know what your Aunt Susie or Sally or whatever says on social media, but I don't know what your Aunt Susie says on social media. And that's part of the problem, algorithms, right? Algorithms in, social, in the social world uh, feed you a limited view of, of, what, of all the possibilities that are out there. Of course, we choose, to consume, we choose to consume one path more than another path. And that's reinforcing with the way that like Facebook's algorithms work. It sends you stuff that it thinks you want to see so that you continue to engage with it, which just further you know, isolates you from other perspectives. A couple of years ago, I was in uh, Beijing to, to teach um, a summer class there. And on the very first day, they were very gracious hosts uh, welcoming us to Beijing and wanted to show us around some of their most iconic places and landmarks. We went to Tiananmen Square and there was a big obelisk that's in the middle. And I asked our tour guide, oh, what's that? You know, what is, what's the writing say? Um, I can't, I can't read anything other than English. And so they told me, oh, that, you know, that's been there forever. That's commemorating when China won World War II. That was news to me. That wasn't how I understood World War II. I didn't know that China won it. Uh, but this was like a 20 year old person at the time. And that is what they understood World War II to be, that they won, they won World War II. And I wondered how that was like, oh yeah, like how did you win? And they said, because we got Japan to leave China, we won World War II. And I just thought like, this is just like what's happening in social media now, right? Of course, history is written by the victors or it's written by the people who can speak the language, right? And then the people who are consuming that media only get one perspective. I did not have China's perspective. That was not what I was taught growing up. And they weren't taught my perspective that it wasn't China who won World War II. Right. And but and like that might seem like an extreme or a silly example. Um, I found it comical at the time that that was 
that 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 was what this 20 year old believed to be the case about about our world history. Uh, but every day we're experiencing that when we try to understand an issue or something's coming up as a current event and we turn to social media to try to understand what's happening, we still continue to get fed a very limited perspective of all the perspectives that are out there. So what are we supposed to do about it? And is it a new problem? It's not a new problem, right? We like to have our perspectives verified. It is human nature when we have an idea, we have a thought or a perspective to first look for information that confirms that viewpoint. Sometimes we look for information that disconfirms that are we wrong, but more often we ask ourselves, are we right? Are we right? We don't ask ourselves in what ways am I wrong? And that can be part of the problem. So, so what are we supposed to do about it? The same thing we always have had to do about it. The platform is different now that might be contributing to this limited misinformation or lack of information that we're getting about other perspectives. But you know, critical thinking has always been the key to this, soliciting outside opinions, talking to people who are different, who come from different places, who grew up in different areas, those people that might be really hard to talk to because you already know they have a different perspective. Like that's what we need to do to try to combat what we might not even realize is the misinformation or limited perspective we're getting by the media that we're consuming. Yeah. Now you kind of mentioned without putting the label on it, cognitive dissonance there. Um, and also, you know, confirmation bias really are they valid excuses nowadays, given the amount of information which is available immediately. I mean, it used to be that if you had a certain political viewpoint that you would only watch a certain news channel, only read a certain newspaper, only watch certain network shows, and you could keep in your bubble pretty easily because effectively if you kept yourself to yourself you could control the channels of you know data which was coming through to you now it's almost impossible not to hear other viewpoints or be exposed to them and so you've really got to make a lot of effort now to be misinformed or make the excuse oh i didn't know i get that on the spur of the moment but if you've got a week's notice about something there is almost literally nothing you can't youtube and google your way out of to at least you know stand your own ground on a topic right right so you know how how do you see the future going when you're gonna ha obviously have some bodies deciding what is right and what is wrong and it might not be what is right and what is wrong but now this polarization is gonna occur where where you could look up facts to the contrary are suddenly eliminated because it's misinformation now obviously the platform i'm talking about is facebook here and it's fact checkers which have a bias um but given that shapes young people's minds and realities what type of society are we going to bring through where they are almost kind of like drip fed what is factual and any kind of thought outside of that is a dissension and misinformation and you get a nasty label thrown on you. I mean, doesn't this sound more like going back to communism? You have put so many big things on the table with that. I mean, we need another hour to unpack just that one question. So I'll give you a couple thoughts to the many things that you, that you just threw out. Um, you know, is it an excuse? Are we allowed to use this as an excuse? No, we're not allowed to use it as an excuse now because, um, but I can understand why people might want to, or they might still like, this might still be a problem that they experience, um, even if they don't want to use it as an excuse, because there are biases in the way that our brain works. Our brain has evolved to have different, to use different shortcuts and have different heuristics um, to help make sense of all of the information that's out there in the world. And so like I was, you, you brought up confirmation bias the, as a term, right? The tendency to seek information that supports rather than refutes our beliefs. That's how our brain works. And so, no, we don't get to use that as an excuse and just say like, hey, everyone's brain works that way because we know it's a thing and a lot of people talk about it. So yeah, that might be how your brain works, but it's still your individual responsibility to do something better than what your brain has been built to do for you to help you like make a decision really quickly. You need to slow it down and you need to look for information that suggests you might be wrong to test whether you're right. You need to uh, second guess or like not just move forward with your knee jerk gut reaction because that's gonna put you down the wrong path. 
So it's, you can't use that as an excuse because we know this is a thing and a lot of people are teaching us all about this being a thing that our brain does that can cause problems. Now, yeah, the world has a lot of easy sources of information that comes from a different perspective. So you can't say like, oh, it was just like, I don't know. I don't know anybody who watches Fox News because you can watch Fox News <laughs> or I don't know anybody who reads the New York Times because you can read the New York Times. So you don't get to use it anymore that like, I don't know how to get the other perspective. I don't know how to find out about what other people think. Everybody can find that out. So that is not an excuse. There, but there are challenges, just like there's challenges to having to override what your brain has evolved to do for you. There's still challenges that you have to overcome to finding that other information. That there's just crap on the internet, right? That is our go-to source for information. And it can be challenging to weed through well, what's true um, and what's not true, or what's a good valid perspective, even if it's, we're not talking about truth here, we're looking for opinions or people's beliefs, what's a good one, what's a well-informed one and what's not. So, you know, that's what I'm saying. Like, you know, what can psychology, studying psychology do for everybody? Well, it's a, it's a tool that helps us to do that critical thinking, to play devil's advocate. It's a, it's a discipline that's all about practicing, trying to take another perspective and think about, think about things from a different perspective. So there is a challenge and the challenge is that there's a lot of crap out there um, and it's for us to slow down, to think about what we're taking in and to try to authenticate um, the source of that information. Do they have valid credentials? How did they come up with their opinion? Where did the facts come from for them? And then assess it at that level. Like, is this something I should be paying attention to? And then if yes, what is it that they're saying? So yeah, you can always find you can find an outlet that shares a, di a different perspective than your own. And whether you're thinking about that source or you're thinking about your own, your own go-to source of information, we gotta be playing devil's advocate with how credible is this information that I'm getting. And just the last thing is like, like yeah, the information is super easy to find out there. It's challenging to know what's good and what's bad information, but we also have limited time. So yeah, the information is plentiful, but our ability, our time to take it all in is limited. We all have lots of things we're doing with our life. And so when I'm saying we have to work slowly and like authenticate the source before we really like ingest it, um, I recognize that the challenge to that is like, we're doing a million things all at once and that can be hard, but we need to know that. We need to recognize that that's the challenge. We have to slow down and, and think about what we're taking in and um, consider trying to find alternative sources of information. Yeah, I mean, that speaks volumes to somebody like me. I'm a Dallas Cowboys fan, and every year we think we're going to win the Super Bowl, and we get proved, you know, every year, I think for the last 30-some-odd years that it still isn't happening. But, hey, we're maybe going to win it this year, but probably not. But, you know, we hang our hopes on that. So let's talk about Clearer, Closer, Better, your book that's out. So tell us a little bit about the book. Sure. The book is, uh, it, it, you know, like I've been talking now, it's about finding new tools, giving people new tools that might not be their go-to strategies for how to overcome challenges with whatever their goal might be. We're talking about, you know, gaining more knowledge in this conversation and dealing with what are the pitfalls of social media and how it's causing problems for our society. Um, and so this book is saying like, well, all right, maybe that's your goal is how can I get a, how can I get a more informed perspective of what's really true out there? Or your goal might be about health and fitness. That's people's number one New Year's resolution every single year is to try to improve where I'm at with my body and my mind this year compared to last year. Um, and we struggle with these. We struggle to find out what's true. How do I how do I know what's really true about this thing that's happening in the world? How do I get how do I save more money? How do I um, how do I get in shape? How do I help my kids have a happy life? Whatever those goals are, we all face obstacles. And sometimes when we face those obstacles, that means we give up on the goal because we just can't see a way around it. And then we're disappointed with ourselves, or we have to like try again at some other point. Um, so what this book does is offer uh, sort of a list of what are the obstacles that are pretty common, regardless of the goals you might be experiencing that, that we face. And then what can you do? Here are four different solutions that can show up in different ways that you might try instead. So it's not offering a formula for like, how do you get a million dollars by next week and lose 20 pounds? That's, you know, there's no formula that can tell you how to do that, but it's about offering you alternatives to increase the odds that you get further in the things that you're trying to accomplish in your life. Now, understand you went on Good Morning America, right? Yeah. Now, was that 
to talk about your book. Yeah. That, that there is that there is a reason behind this question, by the way, because like I, I hope so because yeah. you have me completely lost. Because <laughs> the average because the average viewer of Good Morning America is like normally people who spend about ten minutes on Facebook trying to find out what type of potato they are. So the reason I mentioned that was what is the target audience for your book? Because obviously somebody with an interest in psychology wants a fresh or current, you know, popular. Uh, view to make sure you know they're kind of like in sync of what's going on and the latest thought trends and stuff in the field but who do you aim your book for yeah. if you've got somebody who is beginning to understand that you know being existential being more insular trying to you know reach in deep but then also reach out wide might be something for them which is why again people as they get older tend to be more open to you know meditation and finding other sources of comfort and peace and de-stress in who is your target audience yeah. for your book the target audience is literally everybody because we all have goals that we all struggle to meet i have asked this of thousands and thousands and thousands of people have you ever set a goal that you struggled to meet and no one has ever said no so that's a common denominator among all people is that it that it's hard to meet our goals all of the time so that is the target audience now i'm a scientist i have lots of friends that are scientists and lots of friends that write books uh, about science and oftentimes those books um are meant for people like me you know they're writing in a different style than the way when we like explicitly write for each other but it's like pretty dry or it's meant to like summarize a whole life's work um and it's not fun for like my husband to read who is not a scientist nor interested in the field. Um, so this book is not meant for other scientists necessarily, although there's a lot of good science in there. Um, it's for people who might be looking for, you know, who might find themselves in the self-help section, but don't want people to know they're in the self-help section. This is not a like, I read a lot of the self-help books too. Everything that I have to say in here is backed by science and you'll see it. So it's not just my opinion and it's not just like, here's something that I tried and here's my life's journey, but it's like, here's something that you can try if you're, if you're up against this kind of a problem and here's something else that you can try. Um, it's not meant to be dry. It has a lot of really interesting case studies of really cool people that I've uh, met along the way. Like I was at a party once and met this guy um, who I found out professionally, he's a skydiver. He, he jumps for Red Bull and does amazing things. Like his last thing that he did was jump out of an airplane at 25,000 feet, which is at an elevation where you don't have enough oxygen to actually sustain human life. So you're jumping out, carrying your own oxygen tank and landed in a net. And they did it, this team did it without parachutes. Jumped out of a plane at 25,000 feet, no parachutes on, having to hold their own oxygen and landed in a net that they couldn't see when they jumped out of the plane because it was so high. And how did he do it? That's a cool story. How did they do this? They pulled in teams from like the last Iron Man film and, um, you know, people who worked for NASA, people who construct like... Uh, um, Oh, where airplanes land and the different lighting systems that they use to sort of triangulate a pilot into the right uh, at the right elevation at the right space. So like a really cool team came together to make this whole thing possible. And I am not, I don't jump out of planes. I don't want to jump out of a plane. And if I did, it would have to be with a parachute. But his story actually is relevant to all of us. The take home message of how do they make this thing happen? Like the how, the answer to that is something that all of us can use and it can help us exercise better. It can help us save for retirement. It can uh, help us with any long-term goal where we have to make choices today that affect us in the long run. Um, so it's filled with stories like that, of just like these really amazing people who do something super extraordinary, but that bears on every one of our everyday life experiences. No. Kind of, It kind of reminds me of you know, one of our dreams, right, which is to win the lottery, but then we don't go buy lottery tickets. So we're never going to win the lottery if we don't buy lottery tickets. What would you say if, if you could just tell somebody, you know, in a general goal aspect, is that one hurdle kind of similar to that? Well, if you're going to want to win the lottery, you got to go buy a lottery ticket. What's that one thing you could tell somebody to kind of get past that first hurdle of trying to reach that goal. Yeah, sure. Well, I would say like you're, you're like odds are you're not going to win the lottery even when you buy all those lottery tickets. So maybe don't spend your money that way. But that's just my uh, financial advice. I know it can be fun too, right? So, but that's not what you're asking. You're saying like, hey, I have this goal and I'm not even taking the first step. What am I supposed to do about it? 
uh, like a number of the, one of the most common reasons is that because people set their sights out way too high when they're when they have set that goal like you just did right i want to win the lottery i want i want 100 million dollars in my pocket today we do the same kind of thing when it comes to health and fitness i want to drop 40 pounds before swimsuit season I've, I've never dropped five pounds before swimsuit season why do i think this year is going to be 40. You know, we, we are excited about something that seems like it's going to change our life and we come in hot. We set a goal at a level that probably is impossible. And that's what makes us excited to set it in the first place. And I'm not saying don't dream big, but when we are dreaming big, when we're dreaming at all, you have to, at that planning stage, also couple it with a couple other things, which is concrete action planning. What am I going to do today? That's going to be a step in the right direction. What am I going to do this month? What's this month's goal so that in six months time I can accomplish what it is that I've set out to do? That's step two, dream big, plan concretely. But the third thing is to foreshadow obstacles. We need to think about the ways that this that we might um, be challenged or the ways that this could all go wrong and have a plan B and a plan C lined up. And we need to do that at the goal planning stage. When you're saying, I want to win the lottery, what stands in my way? I don't have enough money that I a disposable income to invest in it, right? And so what am I going to do about that? Well, I got to start saving so that I can spend money on the lottery tickets so that I then can try to accomplish my goal of winning $100 million. People who do that, who dream big, plan concretely and foreshadow failures or think about those obstacles increase the odds of success. The last story I'll leave you with on that topic um, is from Michael Phelps, right? Renowned international swimmer. Back in 2008, when he hit the international stage in the first really big way at the Beijing Olympics, he was on the brink of doing something that no Olympian had ever done before, which is win eight gold medals in a single Olympic game. He had already won seven at the point of this story. And when he dove into the pool for the last competition for his 200 meter fly, like his thing, this is what he's known for, his goggles started to leak. As he had done three lengths of the pool, at the end of that, he just had one length left to go, but his goggles were completely filled with water and he was essentially swimming blind. Now, for me, that would have been the end of the day. I mean, I would never have been in the Olympics anyway. I can hardly keep myself afloat in the pool, but I would have completely panicked and thrown in the towel and said, well, that's it. Like, you know, no gold medal for me, no Olympic history for me. I would have panicked, but he didn't. Instead, he did what his plan B already had been set up to be. He started counting his strokes because he knew exactly how many strokes it would take from him to get from one end of the pool to the other. He practiced for this. He practiced having his goggles filled with water. Sometimes his coach would rip his goggles off of his head as he was diving in for a practice run and smash them on the ground so that there was no way that he could get those goggles. So rather than panic and throw in the towel and think this is a, a failed goal, he just, he just instantly switched to plan B. He won that 200 meter fly. It won him his eighth gold medal and he broke Olympic history. He'd go on to have 15 more medals in his career. So a pretty cool guy, right? Um, but I think that's a great example of like when you're in the moment and when you're facing an obstacle that could that could push you either way, like I either move through this or I'm done. That's not the time to start thinking about a solution. If that was the moment that he started trying to remember, like how many how many strokes did it take for me to get here 10 seconds ago? It wouldn't have worked right he already needed to know what plan b was and he and his coach and his team knew that so they had practiced it they practiced facing obstacles and moving through them so that it was an instantaneous switch uh, and that it didn't require resources in the moment to think about how is he going to move through this obstacle so when you want to win the lottery that's what you got to do dream big plan concretely and foreshadow failure now i want to final question really to ask you before we wrap up today and that was about the phrase social construct because over the last couple of years you know we've heard this thrown about for an example gender is a social construct now for me that isolates whatever message it is they're trying to give across away from the rest of society who doesn't necessarily think like that and doesn't actually allow you to perhaps communicate really what the true goals of what you're trying to say is so like if we say gender is a social construct if you were reasonable you would look at it and say okay this means that you know boys and girls are brought up in traditional gender roles and any aversion to that is normally corrected by society or parents whatever and so most people would be like 
yeah, I can understand that. I don't care which side of the political aisle you're on. Most people would kind of agree with that statement. But if that's the communication that you're trying to send, that, you know, society perhaps tries to pigeonhole people too early on and in doing so puts barriers against progression, you know, for boys and girls in certain areas simply because we're following these predetermined roles of males and females in society, I could get with that and understand that. But as soon as somebody says gender is a social construct, I completely turn off and I don't care what it is you want to discuss because you've already self-isolated yourself from society, saying society is the one which is wrong both traditionally and currently in these models of how it sees gender, and we're the only reasonable forward-thinking people who have got the answers, and if you don't think like us, you know, you're scum of the earth. Do you think this whole, I don't know, almost imagined social construct of creating an argument, sometimes a straw man argument, around something is isolating people from actually having good discussion and allowing people to actually work through issues. So instead of people accepting other people's point of views, it actually creates more polarization by creating these social constructs on based upon a tagline such as, you know, gender being a social construct. I mean, is this going to completely destroy conversation between groups of people who maybe have different views? Yeah. Um, you know, one of my favorite authors to read and researchers to follow is Adam Grant. And I'm sure you've seen, you've heard of his, his books too, probably one of his most famous. He co-authored, um, uh, it was called Plan B and he, um, and, and whatever. He's an amazing behavioral scientist as well and who has written a lot of books that are all New York Times bestsellers. And he just recently put out a statement saying, you know, to say you're right doesn't mean the end of a conversation. It's the beginning of a conversation. Because as soon as you say you're wrong, or you put out a really divisive, strong statement, you shut down the conversation. So all of which is to say, when we're talking about that statement that gender is a social construct, or, or race is a social construct, or X anything, X is a social, social construct, for somebody who doesn't believe that, it shuts down the conversation. But also the other way, those people are saying that when they say gender is a social construct, they're trying to push back against maybe an alternative statement, which is, which is gender is biological. And for them, they hear that in the same way as saying, you're wrong. Like, I don't acknowledge your side. And so it's from both perspectives, both perspectives when they are making like these strong statements uh, are making it challenging for, to, for people in opposition to ever try to even have the conversation to expand or find nuance in the statements that they wanna make. Um, so, so, you know, in that instance, I would say, you know, the coming back to what Adam Grant has to tell us of like, have your first reaction be say like, I understand what you're saying. Like, oh, I get, I get that you're saying that. This is what I'm hearing you say. And I have a different perspective or here's my perspective. Will you listen to it? And not just placate, you know, not just say like, you know, I, I hear you. That's so, you know, I hear you. Yeah, but I think you're, I think you're full of shit or whatever, like you're, this is not true. We need to really mean it. And that's why he's suggesting saying you're right, or this part of what you're saying is right. I, I get that. And here's what I'm thinking so that that conversation can happen. But when you just lead with here's, I believe X and someone says, I believe the inverse of X. What are you supposed to do with that? We have no common ground to, to even start to understand why, where are you coming from? Why do you believe that, that gender is innate? Why do you believe that that gender is societally constructed. To understand the other side, you got to listen to the other side, but we can't do that when we start first by saying you are wrong, which is the way that a lot of people hear it when you make just these bold statements on either side about what your perspective is without acknowledging that there's a possibility for somebody else to also even have a bit of their thinking be correct. Yeah, makes sense. Well, Emily, thank you so much for joining us today. And we know you're up against a, a hard stop at a certain <laughs> time. So we want to make sure that you get to your next deal. Uh, even though we've now bagged on social media, please tell us, you know, how people <laughs> can find you on social media yeah. and, and how to get in touch with you and how they can find your book and all that good stuff. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, I'm on all the platforms, but I don't spend a lot of time on them except for LinkedIn and make sure to post all my content. So if you want to read more 
uh, or, or see where else, what else I'm writing or other thoughts I have. It all gets posted through, through LinkedIn so that it's available for everybody. So probably best to find and follow more content there. Great. So thanks so much for joining us. We certainly appreciate it. Uh, very enlightening, very entertaining. And that will do it for this episode of The Wolf and the Shepherd. And we will catch you on the next one.